Thank you, Peter, and congratulations on a well-deserved uh, award. My name is Bob Jossen, and I have the privilege and pleasure to introduce Andy Lavander. In Deckert, it is appropriate and fitting that we meet on this day at this time, because we have a weekly meeting at Deckert that takes place lunchtime in the Northeast, dinner time in Europe, and breakfast time in the West Coast. And our chair is always looking to get a larger audience to attend these meetings. And he's always interested in expanding the Deckard footprint. So this turnout, especially on a snowy day, is a particularly fitting uh, occasion for the Deckard firm to get together and I want you to know that you are all honorary members for the day of Deckard. And as such, I want to invite you at the end of the lunch to do what every Deckard partner feels is appropriate, and that's to complain to Lavander. <laughs> I've uh, participated in many of these different events, and I know that the normal course is to list the wonderful reasons why the honoree is deserving and receiving the award. I've tired of that a little bit, and I thought it would be interesting instead to tell you some of the reasons which are not reasons why Andy Lavander is receiving the award today. So the first reason, which is not a reason that Andy Lavander is receiving the award, is that he knows how to tie a bow tie. In fact, although Andy has made this a trademark of his persona, the reason that Andy wears a bow tie most of the time is to prevent himself from getting a spot on a real tie, not a matter of sartorial splendor. A second reason, which is not a reason that Andy is receiving the award today, is the little known fact that while he was at Michigan State College, Michigan State University, he perfected his outside jump shot in basketball. And the lack of success in his basketball career has a lot to do with the fact that he became a lawyer. A third reason, which is not a reason that Andy is receiving the award today is his uh, mastery of understatement and observation. In fact, in his home, for Carol and his son Sam and Ben, Andy has the well-deserved nickname of Master Obvious, Captain Obvious. Andy has a way of seeing all these things. The fourth reason which is not a reason that Andy is receiving the award today, is that he is learning how to multitask. Anybody who has sat in Andy Lavander's office and watched him talk on the phone, deal with an email, speak to someone who is seated in front of him, and edit a document at the same time, knows that he has really figured out how to deal with multitasking. And I should assure the clients in the room that that has nothing to do with what Andy's doing when he's dealing with clients when he has your undivided attention. Now I could go on, and there is a longer list, but I suspect that sooner or later I have to get Lavander up here and give him the award. So let me just say briefly, that I've known Andy since the mid-1980s, when together with others, I convinced him to make the unconventional move to join the law firm of Sheriff Friedman, Hoffman, and Goodman, now, as we say, of blessed memory. And since then, I've had the opportunity to work with Andy as a colleague, as a younger partner, he's the younger partner, um, and a friend, and ultimately as the chairman of a great law firm. I have enjoyed and admired 
as I've watched Andy's progress to become one of the most important and successful lawyers in the city of New York, and I dare say, in our country. Andy's legal acumen, his professionalism, his determination, his devotion to clients are unparalleled. You know, despite Andy's successes, he has not lost sight of the human touches. His devotion to his late mother, Eleanor, and to his father, Seymour, who unfortunately cannot be with us here today, but would like to. His devotion to Carol and to Sam, and by the way, Sam, I am told, is actually taking a legal ethics course and thought it was more important for him to be there than in this audience, and I applaud that decision as well. And Ben, his devotion to his family is always premier and paramount in his thoughts. And at the same time, despite an incredibly busy schedule, Andy spends a lot of time and effort working with other lawyers to help them with their careers, to help them develop their styles, to help them learn some of the incredible skills which have made him so successful. He is also somebody who promotes the issue, the interests of diversity and pro bono work at our firm. And in fact, Andy has spearheaded a program at Deckert where we have a very ambitious pro bono requirement for each lawyer in the firm. And Andy is someone who is known to pick up the phone and call a partner and say, you're behind on where your commitment should be. When are you going to finish up with it? That's the way he shows his commitment as well to this important aspect of law firm life. And he is also somebody who is the first to herald and talk about successes in the pro bono area um, when we achieve them in the firm. Andy leads by example. He strives for excellence. He expects no less from those he works with. And he is truly a model lawyer. He is truly a lawyer for all seasons. And it is my great privilege and pleasure to call Andy up to receive the New York Lawyers of the Public Interest Award. Andy, the, the award reads, New York Lawyers of the Public Interest Law and Society Award, Andrew J. Lavander, in honor of your profound dedication to pro bono work, February 13, 2014. Congratulations. Thank you. I've had the great fortune of being Bob's partner since 1985. So like many of you, I know how incredibly skilled an advocate he is. And if any of you did not know that before coming here today, you just heard a master advocate make the implausible seem credible. Thanks, Bob. More broadly, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Deckert, many of whom are here today, including Hector, my partners, my longtime assistant, Gail Hauck, who all have supported this event in so many ways. I also want to thank the many friends and clients who are here today, including those from Monster and Millennium and Universal American Arbor and so many more, who have generously supported this event and have supported me over the years. Congratulations and thanks too to my co-honoree and his family. I did not know Peter before the run-up to this event, although of course I knew of his unbelievable achievements, which I now realize are even greater uh, that Dan has uh, lauded him. But what has been most impressive about Peter uh, in this process has been his laser focus on getting it right and doing the right thing. The fact is that through Peter's determination and the creativity, commitment, and skills of McGregor and the incredible Nilpy staff, I'm not going to try the, the longer word, Marsh and Deckard have teamed up 
with NILPI to initiate a terrific public service project. And it is a great model. We're going to offer health care planning for senior citizens, drawing on the multifaceted skills of NILPI staff led by Marnie Burke and Jessica Lauridan, the Trust and Estates Department at Deckert, and many volunteers from Marsh's Legal Department and Deckert's New York office. We will provide critical pro bono legal and educational services to seniors at the Lenox Hill neighborhood house. These services will range from health care proxies to living wills to medical orders, and we are all very excited to team up with Marsh and NILPI on this project. Now, I mentioned the creativity and commitment of NILPI's staff a, a few moments ago, an exceptional staff that it is, and that was an understatement. The organization we honor today effectively employs a broad range of talents and tactics to tackle the most difficult and pressing problems in New York City, such as toxins in the schools, immigrant rights, access to health care and education, and programmatic reform of important institutions like the foster care system and the warehousing of the mentally disadvantaged. In successfully attacking these seemingly intractable problems, NILPI and its pro bono partners like Deckert and many other firms and uh, organizations here today engage in litigation, community organizing, public relations, and education. NILPI's remarkable track record of success for the poor, the disadvantaged, and other needy groups in this city speaks for itself. As one staff member eloquently described it to us, Peter and myself, at a recent breakfast, NILPI is the voice of the voiceless. The turnout here today, despite the weather, is testament to NILPI's success, its stature, and the importance of being that voice. In truth, that legacy, the names of the founders of this organization, including Cy Vance, Francis Plimpton, and Fritz Schwartz, whom my younger son had the honor of working with last summer at the Brennan Center, and the roll call of names of prior honorees, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Mario Cuomo, is quite daunting to me. My selection this year seems wholly undeserved given this pantheon of pro bono heroes. To be sure, I have enjoyed working on pro bono matters throughout my career. I spent eight, eight years in public service at the beginning of my career, bouncing from job to job after graduating law school. And I've held other public and quasi-public positions since then, as, such as the Associate Independent Counsel in the Deaver investigation. But my recent pro bono record pales in comparison to NILPI and its supporters. I have to admit, I have lost my last five criminal pro bono appeals in a row. Although I think 2014, I've got two, I'm going to make a comeback. That's my, my promise. So the only rationale for my appearance here today is the fabulous pro bono track record of my colleagues at Deckard. Two and a half years ago, I agreed to become chairman of the firm. And one of the consistently wonderful aspects of that job is the great place that pro bono has at Deckard. In conjunction with NILPI and various other terrific partners, we have taken on voting rights cases across the country and fought for the rights of the indigent, the disadvantaged, and the victims of discrimination in courts around the country and in projects around the world. And over and over again, I have received thanks and congratulations from judges, pro bono organizations, and clients. It's really an exhilarating feeling and a wonderful tradition. But again, if I'm to be candid, I can take little credit for our success. I inherited a great tradition and a great program run by our partner, Susie Turner. And my job is basically to give her support and get out of the way. In fact, there's only one aspect of the pro bono program at Deckard that I would take a small bit of credit for. Last year, Dan O'Donnell, who really runs the firm, and I decided that at the partners retreat, we would take on a community service project. So on a hot Friday last April, more than 200 Deckard partners got on buses and went to a beat up looking elementary school in a very poor section of Miami. And we spent the better part of the day painting, planting, fixing, and much to the amazement of our partners and the delight of the teachers and the children, we had a great day. Now afterwards, to a person, all the partners heartily endorsed the project, and this year, we are doing pro bono projects with all the lawyers and staff in each of the 26 cities in which we have offices around the world. But in fairness, That day last April did not start particularly well. I learned some lessons about being chairman of an international firm. The basic rule I learned is, if there's a problem, you're responsible. 
Just before we boarded the buses, our staff began passing out the ugliest bright yellow t-shirt I have ever seen. Now, I had never seen these shirts or heard about them before, uh, but I immediately became the object of, of scorn and derision. First, a group of my female partners came to me and said, you know, these are all male cut t-shirts. I said, point well taken, sorry. That was just the beginning. The t-shirts on the back said, lawyer, collaborator, and volunteer, which I thought sounded pretty good. But that led the French delegation to come to me en masse. Collaborateur? How could you say that? <clears throat> OK. So just as I was about to pull out my hair and get out the masking tape and cover up collaborator on each of these t-shirts, one of the classier partners in Paris said, well, you know, it's on the back, so that shows it's in our past. So now having survived those two things, I was heading to the bus and one of my London partners came to me and said, you know, volunteer, that's not accurate. You've directed me to do public service. <laughs> At that point, I lost my collegial cool and said something like, damn straight, get on the freaking bus. As between you and me, you're not a volunteer. As between you and the school, you are. And that may be my best contribution to pro bono at Decker. <laughs> Seriously, though, let me say thank you to Nilpi, thank you to Decker, and thank you to my friends, colleagues, and most of all, my family. To my 90-year-old dad, who taught me everything I needed to know about hard work, academic e excellence, integrity, and helping the disadvantaged. To my two grown sons, one of whom is graduating law school and the other who's on his way there, and both of whom have started their own real pro bono traditions on their own. And most of all to Carol, my wife of more, th of, of more than 30 years, who is simply my best friend and collaborateur. <laughs> in addition to her accomplished career as an architect, she was sworn in last summer as a fellow of the AIA. She has found the time to take on her own pro bono projects, including her work for the Center for Art Education and the Foundation for Architecture, to take the lead in raising two great sons and most remarkably to put up with me for about 30, 40 years now. You've made my life rich and possible, and I thank you all. And I thank you all for supporting this event and being here, particularly on a day like today. Thank you very much.